Some argue that the recent development of naval drones have revolutionized maritime warfare forever. But I would argue that this is not the case. Not just yet. You see, over the past year and a half, Ukraine has launched over a dozen naval drone attacks against Russian naval ships and maritime infrastructure, where some attacks have been more successful than others. And even though it's no small feat for a country without a navy to deny Russia full control of the Black Sea, the number of attacks to date have been quite small. Ukraine initially had an element of surprise, but not anymore. Russians have more or less adapted to a constant threat of naval drones by using countermeasures. So it's fair to say that naval drones are not as revolutionary, especially when you compare them to the use of FPV drones, where hundreds if not thousands of them are used by both sides every single day. But why Ukraine's successful attacks with the help of naval drones don't tell us much about the effectiveness of these weapons. Why the US military established Task Force 69, I mean 59, and if the naval drones turn out to be a revolutionary idea after all, who becomes the biggest winner of this technology is not what you think. On July 17, 2023, Ukraine launched five naval drones toward the Crimean Bridge, each carrying 2,000 pounds of explosives. The drones were controlled via a satellite link from Kyiv, which was as far as 500 miles away. According to Ukrainians, they did not use Starlink due to the disagreement with the world's richest man, Elon Musk. Now, how exactly the communication link with a naval drone was established is a secret. However, what is known is that the time lag between the operator and the drone was somewhere between one and a half to two seconds. This made it difficult to control the drone in order to hit the pillars of the bridge. Nevertheless, after multiple attempts, two of the Ukrainian naval drones successfully hit the target. The other three drones never made it to the bridge, as reportedly they had to change course due to Russian patrols and ran out of fuel. As a result of the explosion, the road traffic was restricted to a single lane until October 14, 2023, when all four lanes were reopened. This made it much harder for Russians to resupply their army in the southern Ukraine, since the Crimean Bridge was a vital supply route for the Russians. Even though this route is currently fully operational, it's widely believed that the Crimean Bridge is a security burden for the Russian Federation, because they had to deploy air defense systems and personnel that could be otherwise used elsewhere. According to Ukrainian estimates, Russia has at least spent $1 billion protecting the bridge as of January 2024. Another successful attack happened eight months before the bridge explosion, when seven Ukrainian naval drones along with nine aerial drones attacked the Sevastopol naval base. At least three Russian Navy ships were damaged during this attack. In response, Russians quickly began deploying countermeasures such as underwater nets, booms, pontoons, and even dolphins. But as we already mentioned, these countermeasures didn't help the Crimean Bridge eight months later. Speaking of countermeasures, Russians have also started using patrol boats and helicopters, specifically to target Ukrainian drones. Other countermeasures used included electronic jamming, FPV drones, and even Dazzle camouflage. Dazzle can confuse the Ukrainian naval drone operators by camouflaging the true heading of Russian ships. Some argue that signal jamming is the most effective way to combat remotely operated vessels, but that's easier said than done. As Russians found out in Ukraine, their jammers not only block Ukrainian communications, but also their own. Plus, an active jammer instantly becomes a priority target for radar homing missiles. All that said, the effectiveness of all these countermeasures is debatable, since Ukraine only publishes their successful attacks while dismissing unsuccessful attempts as Russian propaganda. And here is a good example of this. On May 24, 2023, three Ukrainian naval drones attacked the Russian intelligence-gathering ship Ivan Khurs. Russians claimed the ship was not damaged and that they had destroyed all three drones. They even posted a video of destroying one of the naval drones. 
In contrast, Ukrainians claimed that they had hit the ship and posted this video, which to be honest, is inconclusive. Shortly after, a video emerged of the undamaged Ivan Kurs returning to Sevastopol. But Ukrainians were quick to pinpoint that it was a two-year-old video. Since then, a few new videos and pictures have emerged of Ivan Kurs. And one thing is for sure, the ship had not been destroyed. Although, whether or not it was damaged is still unknown. My point is that without knowing the true statistics of attempts versus hits, it's really hard to judge how effective these naval drones really are. But hey, we could always look back at history. While using naval drones filled with explosives may seem like a new idea, if you dig down, it really isn't. Remotely controlled boats were used by militaries as early as the 1920s. After World War II, the US Navy started using remotely operated craft for target practice and also for mine-sweeping operations. If you remove the remotely controlled part, today's naval drones are nothing more than Japanese suicide boats called Shinyo. These motorboats had sustained speeds of around 30 knots and were able to deliver 660 pounds of explosives. And just like today's naval drones that can be equipped with rockets, these suicide boats also had two anti-ship rockets mounted on each side. In total, over 6,000 Shinyo suicide motorboats were produced for the Imperial Japanese Navy. Additionally, Japan built over 400 suicide torpedoes called Kaiten, which compared to regular torpedoes had the advantage of having a pilot steer the weapon toward its final target. But no matter who controls the vessel, a remote operator or a suicide pilot, the countermeasures would still work the same. Well, minus the signal jamming. If you compare the success rate of kamikaze planes versus Shinyo motorboats and Kaiten torpedoes, kamikaze planes were much more successful at hitting their target, which was about 19% of the time. Kaiten suicide torpedoes had roughly a 3-7% to success rate, since only three ships were hit out of about 100 attempts. The least effective of all were Shinyo suicide boats. According to the Japanese, entire units were wiped out by Americans. Out of the 6,000 suicide boats built, only 4,000 were used during combat, out of which only 12 had confirmed hits. At face value, that's a 0.3% effectiveness rate. But in reality, a lot of the boats were instead used for transport missions, so their actual success rate is probably higher. What's interesting is that when it comes to naval attacks, it looks like we've come full circle. During World War II, the emergence of countermeasures like sea nets, torpedo belts and bulges against underwater and surface attacks pushed militaries to switch to missiles. Now that militaries can intercept missiles, they are going back to using surface vessels for attacks. And that's because these vessels actually have some advantages. While unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs, such as the Iranian Shahed drones, pose a threat to ships, they can be easily intercepted. And even if an aerial drone hits the ship, the damage control capabilities on modern ships will be able to withstand and recover from most airborne attacks. But compared to UAVs, naval drones can carry much bigger payloads, and this poses a greater threat to ships. If naval drones are properly directed, they could detonate at the waterline near propellers or magazines, which increases the likelihood of catastrophic damage. Naval drones are much harder to detect due to their low profile, which washes their radar signature between the waves. They're also fast and can travel at speeds of up to 60 knots, although only for short distances, otherwise they would quickly run out of fuel. Combine this with the highly trafficked waterways and night hours, and you got yourself a stealthy weapon. Modern naval drones use water jet propulsion systems, satellite communications, and also optical infrared lenses that help them see at night. Add GPS and intelligence satellites, and you have a weapon that's capable of attacking both ships and naval structures a thousand miles away. 
counter technologies are also important. To avoid detection, you often need to sail around, which means the drone would need more range. To accomplish this, a solar-powered drone like Sail Drone could be used, which harnesses both solar and wind energy. What happens if signals get jammed? Go old school, use a wire to communicate with the drone. Modern naval drones have without a doubt come a long way from the Japanese Shinyu suicide boats. Not only the operator doesn't have to die, they're even more protected than a HIMARS operator. HIMARS and naval strike missiles are easily targetable once they unmask to fire. This is why they must employ shoot and scoot tactics to survive. In contrast, naval drones don't suffer from the same problem. They can be deployed remotely from a concealed holding area within the contested area. This greatly reduces risks for the operators without the need to relocate. The future of littoral combat is envisioned to be not the LCS ships, but the small marine littoral regiments or MLR which will operate in contested areas and will be able to fix, target, and disrupt enemies' plans with the help of these naval drones. And let's not forget about costs. A single Ukrainian Sea Baby naval drone costs $300,000 to build, making it a powerful asymmetrical weapon against a $650 million Russian warship. At a cost comparison of over 2100 to 1, Ukraine could easily justify multiple drone attacks to decommission one Russian warship. This is why the US military currently has the goal to mass-produce naval drones that cost under $250,000 per unit. And this is precisely why Task Force 59 was established. Task Force 59 integrates all sorts of unmanned surface vessels or USVs into the US Navy's 5th Fleet. A big part of this is integrating all three domains of operations in the air, at surface, and underwater. Unmanned underwater vehicles, or UUVs, are arguably the most dangerous since they are the hardest threats to detect. But compared to surface drones, they are more expensive, slower, have less range, and are much harder to communicate with. This is why lots of UUVs operate fully autonomously. Now, there are also some surface drones that are fully autonomous, which can avoid collisions, identify foes from friends, and attack them. But naval drones can do much more than just attacking enemy targets. USVs can protect harbors, like a harbor patrol boat, and use both lethal and non-lethal weapons. Other functions include evacuation of personnel and equipment, or being used as a logistical asset. Drones can also free up human resources from doing dull or dangerous tasks. For example, in the case of UAVs, instead of a helicopter doing surveillance for 3 hours, why not have a drone do the same thing for 12 hours? Same goes for mines. Instead of putting people in danger, drones are a much more common sense choice. It's true. Using naval drones packed with explosives against warships is a new mode of warfare which essentially didn't exist prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But Ukrainian successes with naval drones may not be enough to tip the scale in this war, because it's not a naval conflict. But what is clear is that the use of naval drones by Ukraine has not only pushed other navies to take this threat seriously, but also to develop their own naval drones. Now, it's doubtful that such drones will be widely used by the US or Chinese navies anytime soon, and that's primarily due to numbers alone. It would take much time to develop and build sufficient quantities of naval drones for a full-scale conflict. In the short term, the really scary risk is that some non-state actors, such as the Houthis, could use naval drones to harass commercial ships off the coast of Yemen and intercepting such drones would be much harder than aerial drones. In the long term, if naval drones do take over the naval battlefield, the real winners would be submarines, since radio waves cannot penetrate too deep into the water to remotely control an underwater drone, and not to mention 
that it would be extremely challenging for both surface and underwater drones to detect a submarine underwater in the first place. <laughs>